So here we are at question 11. So question 11 for this one, the diagram shows the bonds present in a molecule of COCl2. Now they've given us a really good diagram here actually, and you can see the angles all the way around appear to be 120 degrees for this. So we've been asked to identify what the shape is, and the shape, straightforward here unfortunately, really straightforward question, is trigonal planar. So hopefully, when you do get multi-choice questions like this, you are able to answer it in less than a minute and move on from that. Can't be non-linear because it would need uh, two bond pairs and two lone pairs. Pyramidal would need one lone pair and three bond pairs, and tetrahedral would be four bond pairs. Now here we have actually got a double bond, but look at the arrangement here, and you should know that the uh, angles around a carbonyl group like so, so this is aldehydes, ketones, and carboxylic acids in year one, but it also extends to the acyl chlorides, amides, and esters in the upper six, you should know that this is 120 degrees around there, so it is going to be D. Next one just here. Now this is absolutely crucial because it's a really good example of some disproportionation. This is where an element is simultaneously oxidized and reduced in the same equation. And the example of this, if I call these reactions one and two, the example of this is in reaction one. If you look at reaction one, if you look closely at it, the H plus stays as H plus on either side of the reaction. What we also have then is if we look a little closely, we've got hydrogen peroxide. Now hydrogen peroxide contains the very rare oxygen with a one minus charge inside that. It's incredibly rare, but you do need to be aware of it. It is on your checklist before you go into the breadth or depth exams. Now what we can also see then is oxygen goes from one minus to two minus in H2O, and the oxygen also goes to a zero in a molecule of O2. So O2 has an oxidation state of zero. If we look at equation two, for equation two we start off with H2 and O2 which are both going to be zero and the hydrogen forms H plus ions and the oxygen forms O2 minus ions like so. If we're looking at these statements then, we've been asked here hydrogen is both reduced sorry, is reduced in both reactions. We can see here nothing actually happens with the hydrogen, so that can't be true. Hydrogen is reduced in only one of the reactions. Well, actually, over here, the hydrogen, when it does react, is actually oxidized, and it was the oxygen here that was reduced, so it can't be that. Oxygen is oxidized in both reactions. Well, actually, in this one over here, although it does get oxidized on this side, so oxidation, remember, is a loss of electrons, so we can actually see if we have O minus here, and we go to two minus, that would be a reduction, and this one here would be an oxidation. Here the question is oxygen is oxidized in both, here it's reduced, even though it does get oxidized on this side, it's only reduced on this one, so it can't be that. So here, oxygen is oxidized in only one of these reactions, it's got to be here, we've got our oxidation just there, going from, let's try that again, O minus over to the O2, which is zero. Moving on then to question 13. So for question 13, we've got quite a lot of maths associated with this one. So make sure you've got yours to hand because we are going to go through a lot of the numbers for this. Now we are actually told right at the start of this, 0 0.01 mole of barium is added. So what I tend to do is I tend to write the numbers in. You're told the volume of water does not change, so that means it's fixed at this 500 just here. Just going to write that up there, just a little bit bigger so I can see it more clearly. And I've been asked which statement is correct. And everything here appears to relate to the moles of other reactants and products that are written in this equation. So I'm going to write the moles of water that would be required. And since it's a 1 to 2 ratio, the number of moles of water is actually going to have to be 0.02. For the barium hydroxide, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So the moles of barium hydroxide that are formed are going to be the same as the number of moles of barium that reacted. So that's 0 0.01. And the same is true for the hydrogen. It's in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the number of moles of hydrogen that are formed is going to be the same as the number of moles of barium that reacted. So then for this first one, the number of hydroxide ions formed is 0 point, uh, sorry, 0 0.01 times 10, sorry, times 6.02 times 10 to the power 23. So what we've actually got here is this appears to be a mole quantity, and this is our Avogadro constant. So we don't actually need a number at the end, we just need to look at this relationship between these two numbers. Now this uses your um, named Avogadro triangle, which 
which is these three compared to each other. So number of molecules, atoms, whatever. And you've got moles and the Avogadro constant just here. Now, if you were to actually look at the hydroxide then, barium hydroxide has the formula of BaOH2, which means from every one mole of the barium, you actually get two moles of the hydroxide. So here, if I make 0.01 mole of barium hydroxide, then I must have 0.02 mole of the hydroxide ion. And here in this calculation, they appear to use a mole value, which is just for the intact barium hydroxide, not for the hydroxide ion, which is OH minus. And so we can immediately say that A is not a valid correct statement. Next one, the volume of hydrogen gas produced is 0.24 centimeters cubed. So what we can do for this one is we can actually calculate what the volume would be. So volume for a gas like so, we assume this is under, in fact we don't need to assume at all, it's under standard conditions. So volume for this is going to equal moles times 24 and that would give us an answer in decimeters cubed. I can use 24,000 if I want to get an answer in centimeters cubed for this one. So numbers for this are going to be 0.01 times 24, so 24,000 like so. And that's going to give me an answer of 240. Now, that's obviously not the same answer as they've got here. So it cannot be that at all. So it's definitely not this one. The concentration of barium hydroxide formed is 0.02 mole per decimeter cubed. Well, let's find out. So we've got 0.01, which is our moles of barium hydroxide. And we're going to divide by 500 over a thousand here to get it into moles per decimeter cubed and our answer for this one actually comes out as, let's just move that out of the way, our actual little answer comes out as 0.02. Brilliant, that actually is that number. So this at the moment is my absolute winner. Now next one, 0.05 mole of water reacts. Now if we actually look at the number of moles, so it's 0.005, don't know if I said that right. If we actually look up here, we can see that is absolutely not true whatsoever. We can see that the number of moles of water that reacts is actually two times the barium. It's not going to be divided by two, which is what they've done here. So that is categorically wrong. We can see it's nothing like this number. So our correct answer here is C. Next one then, just moving down. So this is on to question 14. Which statement is not correct for a system in dynamic equilibrium? Now, what that means is, once again, three of these are correct. Now, straight away, we're going to get this one pretty quickly. The concentrations of products and reactants are the same. This is actually not a correct statement because we would say they stay the same. So they stay at constant levels, but they aren't the same as each other. So at the moment, that actually is the incorrect statement. So I'm going to put A in here. But that means these are correct statements, and this will help us revise a bit. The equilibrium can be achieved from both sides. That means instead of just mixing all the reactants together and putting it under closed conditions, you can actually mix all the products together instead. And so that one's true. Get the same equilibrium. The rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backwards. Absolutely it is. And the system is closed. Yep, that means you can either put a lid on it, and keep it nice and isolated, or you could dissolve everything in a suitable solvent and keep it at a constant temperature. Next one, question 15. So for question 15, what is the systematic name for the molecule shown? Now, you can number this chain in two different directions, but I am gonna number it one, two, three, four, five, and here there is a methyl group. Now, the reason to do that is instinctively, if you have an oxygen containing group, you try and give the carbon that it's connected to the lowest number possible. But it's going to be important very shortly anyway to help us achieve the lowest uh, set of locator numbers possible. So here, let's just label the rest of this. So five carbons in the longest chain means I'm going to have pent as part of my name. I've got a four methyl just here, which I've labelled on as a CH3. It was just the end of the line in skeletal before, but I've drawn that on to help me see it. And I've also got a 1-ol, which represents my alcohol group on carbon 1. There's no carbon here at the end of this line where the oxygen is there. If we show a different atom at the end of the line, then it means there is no carbon present there. Now, if we connect this together, our name is going to be 4 methyl pent and one Oh. 
which is right here, it's option C, which is our correct answer. Now, that means we can get rid of these two as obvious, but here you can see that B is actually the same thing but numbered in the other direction. So instead of a 4 here, we have a 2, and instead of a 1 here, we have a 5. Now, the sum of these numbers is actually a 7, as opposed to the sum of numbers that I got, which was a 5. And since 7 is greater than 5, it can't be this combination here, which they've suggested for B. You want to try and get the smallest combination of numbers possible. And this oxygen-containing group should get a lower number as a rule of thumb. Moving on then to question 16. Question 16 is a bit of a tricky one. What I did for this one is I drew out the skeletal structure of each of them. So I'm just going to draw those out briefly here. If you're quick with skeletal, then this is how I recommend you do it as well. 2,2-dimethylbutane. Looks like that. 2-methylheptane, quite good. So hep is 7, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And 2-methyl, but see there, that's quite a long open chain there actually. Uh, C, gosh, that's a lot of branches. So you've got pence, that's one, two, three, four, five. And then you've got three trimethyl groups. One, two, three, like so. Sorry, two, three, and four, I should have said with numbering, but still. Three ethyl pentane, one, two, three, four, five. And then on carbon number three, one, two. And you're asked for this one, which molecule has the highest boiling point? So this one is going to be highest boiling point, which has got the strongest... London intermolecular forces because that's what happens between alkanes. We have London forces. Remember these used to be called van der Waals in the old Mart schemes, but London forces is all that happens. Now in order to get stronger London forces, what you need is lots of electrons, which is kind of observed by seeing a large MR value, a large molar mass value for the molecule, and you also need a straight chain. or as much straight chain as possible. Limit the branches, fewer branches. So if you want a high boiling point, something with that's difficult to boil, you need to make sure that you've got a big MR and you've got a straight chain. If you had something, for instance, that has lots of branches, that's easier to boil because it's got a low surface area contact between the chains, so weaker London forces. And if you've got fewer electrons, well, London forces are caused by a temporary induced dipole. And if you've got fewer electrons, that dipole is going to be smaller. So the one here that's got the straightest possible chain and the largest MR going is going to be B. All right, so my answer here is B. Next one, we've got another mole calculation one. Just getting near the end of these now. The equation for the reaction of aqueous phosphoric acid with aqueous sodium hydroxide is shown below. So again, we've got lots of data for this one. Now instinctively here, I've got data for the H3PO4, so it allowed me to calculate the moles here of 5 times 10 to the minus 3. I've got a concentration for the sodium hydroxide, but I don't have a mole value yet. This is concentration, and the reason I don't have a mole is because I haven't been told a volume for the NaOH. I haven't been given that at all. Which statement is correct? So these two reacted together to make these. The end point occurs when 25 centimeters cubed of NaOH has been added. Well, let's try and figure that out then. So when would the end point occur? The end point would occur when the two mole values of these are enough to react each other completely. So I know I've got a 1 to 3 ratio, and I know that I have 5 times 10 to the minus 3 of the phosphoric acid. So what I need to then concern for this is if I times my value for by 3, it's going to tell me how many moles of the sodium hydroxide I require. So if we just keep it simple, we can just see an easy conversion here. That's 15 times 10 to the minus 3 there. The math department wouldn't be very pleased with that, but it's not their channel. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means I need that many moles of the sodium hydroxide just here. Now, 25 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide, if the concentration is 0.6, what does that actually give me in terms of the number of moles? So here, if I do moles equals, so remember, we've got a triangle of moles, concentration, and volume. If I want to get the number of moles, I need to do the concentration times the volume just here. So if I need to do moles equal concentration times volume, that's going to be 25 over 1,000. And it's going to be a concentration value here of the 0.6. Hopefully that makes sense for everyone just there. 
And what that actually gets me is... Sorry, awkward pause there. What that actually gets me is... The 15 times 10 to the minus 3. Now it won't appear like that actually on your calculator screen, but I do get that kind of information that is really helpful for me, and it does let me know that that was the required amount of sodium hydroxide there needed for this reaction to take place. So it absolutely is this one here. Endpoint occurs when 75, we've just proved wrong. After titration, the final solution contains that many moles of Na3PO4. Well, we know it can't, it's going to be the same number of moles of the phosphoric acid because they're in a one to one ratio, so it can't be that. And the final titration contains 0.15 mole of H2O. Well, that can't happen either, because even if you do figure that out over on this side, we have got some aqueous feature here of the reactants and the products, and so all the aqueous added together would actually make the moles of water more than that, and so it can't be this one. It's got to be A just at the end there. Next one then, question 18. So for question 18, this one's quite straightforward. It just wants you to figure out what the combination is, and you can see it's just a combination of ionic and metallic for the structures just here. What I did notice was they absolutely have to be different from each other. They can't both be giant ionic because one of them has the ionic, giant ionic lattice features of conducting electricity when molten or aqueous, whereas the other seems to conduct electricity whatever, which would imply that it is a metal. So I'm looking for a metal and giant ionic lattice combination just here. Solubility in water backs this up as well, and the high uh, boiling and melting points really are irrelevant considering uh, the data we're given down here. But the correct answer for this has got to be D. Looking down here, this is the ideal gas equation question. So for the ideal gas equation, we are looking at PV equals NRT. And it wants the calculation for mole, which would be mole equals PV divided by RT. And the only one here that actually represents that is D. So the correct answer here needs to be D. Moving on to our final question, question 20. So for this one, we want to think about a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve for this one. If you have a low temperature curve, and you mark on the activation energy here, you can see that all these particles are able to react upon collision. The question is, which statement explains why the rate of reaction increases when the temperature increases? The activation energy of the reaction decreases. So if I put on a, temp a curve for a higher temperature, we can see that the activation energy is the same, so it's not that. That would be if we added a catalyst. It's definitely not B then, because that's just the reverse of the other. The proportion of molecules exceeding the activation energy decreases. Well, that can't be true either, because I can see that there's more in this space here. And so it has to be D, which backs up the graph saying that there's more molecules able to react upon collision. I hope that takes you through the multi-choice nice and well. I'll let you get back to your revision. Thanks for watching the whole video or video set. Happy revising.